Well, today, uh, uh, Mike Gleischer is here from the University of Wisconsin. Um, he's actually coming home because Mike did his PhD here at CMU under Andy Whitkin. What year? 94. 94. Before, uh, before, before you Paul was on my committee. Oh, Paul, you were on the Before you were team. born. Before I was born. <laughs> um, and, then, <laughs> and then Mike went off to, to industry, I believe. Yep. You did after for Autodesk, Apple, was there anything else? Nope. And then you came Wisconsin. back to academia for the University of Wisconsin. And been there ever since. So he's done a lot of work in graphics, some work in visual, uh, visualization, some work on the corner of, of vision. And so he's going to talk about a lot of topics today. So I'll let him take it from here. Right, thank you very much. Um, so the, the, the title that I gave was from art and perception to visualization and video and I said had added at the last minute virtual reality. It wasn't on what you saw, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Um, I always like to begin where most people end with the important acknowledgement that everything that you see here was done with a set of spectacularly good collaborators and students. Um, uh, in particular, I'm, today I'm going to show work done by Feng Lu, who's now a former student, Greg Cipriano, who is a now former student, a actually Aaron Bryden is also a now former student, um, Danielle Albers and uh, Kevin Ponto. Uh, I'm not going to show any of these people's work today. but. Um, Okay, so uh, a big title, um, but uh, I just sort of need, I couldn't call it this, but um, that's really what it's about. Um, so let me start with this slide. So the question is, what do these have in common? All right. Well, here's a bunch of answers. Um, and the top one, I think, is really the big one. Um, for those of you who know me, I have, I'm interested in way too many things. I guess I have like academic attention deficit disorder. Um, there are some, there are many unifying threads through this, um, and some of those hopefully will come out. Uh, but th things like it is about data, it is about pr effective presentation, um, it is about build, using, c combining understanding and presentation. But to be honest, it re this really is sort of a a, a swath through a bunch of things I've done to try and get at what is the common theme. And if I want to give you one message to take away, it's this common theme that I like to see through everything I do. I think it's a really good lens to look at the world. Um, I like to try and look at the world to try and see how can I use the understanding of how we see and how people have made pictures and or just more generally how people have created the artistic traditions over the past, well, long time, and use that as a way of building better computational tools for things like how we communicate, how we, un how we understand data, um, how we just create things. Um, so the one thing is that I put human perception artistic traditions together a little bit, which people don't normally do, but they really often point us in the same directions. That you know, the artists have been doing this for thousands of years. They've really learned how, how we perceive the world and how to create visual representations that help us see things. Um, now, more recently, the, the, the psychologists, mainly in the past 30 years, they've been developing stuff a lot faster. Now, you'd think that with 25,000 years, we'd be better off just sticking with, let's just learn from them. Um, the unfortunate part is, Artists aren't always so easy to learn from. Um, the nice thing about trying to learn from perceptual sciences is they, they tend to, to, to make things a little bit easier. So over the course of this talk, what I want to try and do is give you some sense of both, what, uh, both why human perception and artistic traditions are very similar ways of getting us towards being able to do better things. Um, and to sort of also see where communication and, and data understanding, how these, so they all come together and benefit from this understanding. So with this, I'm going to take you on a tour through a whole bunch of projects. Um, I'm going to start with some molecule stuff. I'm going to do some, show you some genetics visualization, a bunch of video stabilization, and then get to some VR things. Um, the order chosen here is, is pretty specific to tell this story. Um, but also, you'll see some things, some themes from earlier things coming back. So let's start with um, just something to give you an idea of where art and perception come together to, uh, to, to lead us to do something. 
So um, this is a molecule. Uh, just as, as an aside, um, you might not be used to seeing molecules this way. So just to give you a little bit of context, you might sort of, proteins are big molecules. They have lots of little pieces inside. If you try and draw a picture of all the stuff inside, it gets really hard to see. Uh, so people who look at proteins, um, they often use these more abstract diagrams of what's going on inside. Unlike sort of the simple chemistry you learn in high school, proteins actually work together not by sort of, you know, sort of the insides doing stuff, it's the outsides, they have to they sort of fit together. So very often they try and figure out, well, what is the shape, overall shape of this thing? Because this, the, all these molecules exclude stuff on the outside. So they figure out, well, what is the shape, the envelope around these things? And they draw pictures that kind of look like this. So this is this envelope around all the stuff that's inside. The coloring here is based on electrostatic charge, um, which is a, sort of a, a thing that chemists are interested in. All right, so let's go back to this. What shape is this? Protein shape. Well, I look, so I, look, I, I know the answer. It kind of looks like a blob, maybe like a, like a heart, kind of a, a blob. <laughs> Um, all right, here, what, sh what shape is it really? It's kind of like a cup. Well, actually, a, a bad viewpoint, it's actually a cone. Now you might say, well, why do you care? You care a lot because the, what this thing does is it has to be a cone because it pulls things through it. And it's a way that sort of things get into cells. So it's very, this sh the fact that understanding the shape is really important. Um, but notice, by drawing this picture differently, I can make it much easier for you to very quickly figure out what this shape is. So what went on to do that? Well, there was a bunch of simplification. I didn't show you all the little details. Um, I was very, I didn't try and make it look like a, real, a, a realistic piece of plastic. This is a very sort of stylized, in terms of the lighting, in terms of looking like a line drawing. Um, and then also, on the surface, I put little notes with kinds of information that well, are, is particularly interesting if you're a chemist. All right, now, was this driven by art or perceptual science? You might say that I, my simplification was, an artist would call it abstraction. A, uh, a visual cognitive science would say you want to do cue reduction because you don't want to overload cues. Um, did I use the artistic tradition of trying to get the lighting right? Or was I th really thinking about, well, what are the things that provoke the depth perception via a shape from shading? Um, either of these, you can sort of get at the same kinds of result from the same way. And so this is sort of a way to think about how to make these kinds of pictures. Uh, but at the end of the day, what this leads you to are pictures of molecules that look like this rather than like this because you're know, driven either from your art, art, art driven or perception driven designs. Um, and this turns out to be important because, well, if you stare at these, like say, why, these things to, are very similar. This molecule cuts long chains of, of RNA. Um, this one here, is much better at it than this one here. This one here is so good, it's a, it can be an anti-cancer drug. You have to stare at it, you know, there is a big difference of why this one works that actually comes out quite quickly. It actually is the position of those little H's. Okay, so art perception, sort of molecular shape. So that's just sort of the warm up. Let's sort of go to another one. Um, so now I'm going to show you another sort of trick to do with molecules, more, much more inspired, pr driven by an artistic tradition. So specifically, we were interested in making use of how people convey motion in a static image. And there's a really rich tradition of this. Um, this, this picture here is from Scott McCloud, although it's actually taken from somebody else who's, who's citing Scott McCloud, especially in comic books, but there's just also just people make diagrams and art that try and show here is what the motion is, even though it's a static image. And we wanted to apply this to molecular motions. Those proteins that I showed you, they don't sit still. They move around a lot. Understanding how they move around is really important to the biologists who try, who try and understand these things. Um, sometimes you can sit there and watch the whole movie. Other times you want a quick summary of this is how it moved. 
So they draw pictures like this, where they put little arrows on some, sub, well, some subset of the, of the atoms. This is the way they're going to go. It doesn't tell me very much. We wanted to, oh, I guess I should also say, the motions that we're interested in are based on these very coarse grain simulation where they're trying to get the big picture of what the molecule is going to do. This molecule here is going to sort of fold up to sort of eat something, like a Pac-Man. Um, they want to try and understand that, that high level picture of what's going on, not necessarily the individual details of what each individual molecule is going to do. So how can we try and convey that in a picture? based on just an un, you know, given the molecule and, and its movement. Uh, so we turn to the artistic tradition to try and build things that use those comic book style arrows to indicate what's going on. I actually had it backwards. It, it closes that way. So how does this work? So we're going to begin with this inspiration from, the, from comic books and diagrams of trying to use these arrows to convey the shape and motion and also to give the sense of with the curved arcs that this thing is pretty much going to move, move in, a, in a rigid way. It really is sort of, these are two rigid pieces and it's a hinge. Um, well, the pro why not show the actual video itself? Um, so that's a great question, so why not show the video? So first is the, 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 the video, it's, you abstract, the video itself is hard to produce because you have to do the whole simulation. The actual, the actual coarse grain analysis just tells you there is you know, the sort of initial shape. Uh, watching the video takes time. You can't look at a lot of them. Videos are very difficult to compare. Um, videos you can't put in a journal as a journal figure. Um, I could keep going, but those are the ones I remember off the top of my head. So, um, all right. So the issue that I have, the problem that I need to solve, is that for each atom, I know what direction it's what direction it's moving. So I have its in, I have its velocity, its instantaneous velocity, and I want to be able to sort of convey that. The obvious thing to do is to draw a little arrow. Um, let's see what we can do that's better. So the first thing we're going to try and do is to, is to abstract this. Now, to abstract, the abstraction that I want to do is to, find groups of, is to find groupings that move in related ways. This is a little bit tricky because I'm interested in groups that move rigidly. Um, so this whole group here is a nice rigid group. It's rotating around its center. Um, even though this and this are actually moving in different directions. And the red and green ones in the middle are moving the same direction. Yeah? Uh, are these motions deterministic, or is there uh, sort of uh, uncertainty to that? So, all right, so the model itself is completely deterministic. So what this is actually saying, so the, the, coarse, gra the, the coarse grain analysis is saying, statistically, this is the, mo the, well, it's, this is the most energy, energetically favorable motion. Or a, a different way, to be more precise, it's there is a space of energetically favorable motions, and this is one of the, ba one of the eigenvectors of the space. So it's kind of a, they're trying to convey a likely direction that in general things are going to move. So this, this is the expected? It's, yeah, it, it's an expected movement, and actually they generally look at multiple ones of these as kind of basis vectors for the space. OK, so I want to try and group things to fit these, these models. Uh, one of the uh, nice things about the fact that, I, that the biology says these things are generally pretty rigid is something that's rigid in terms of its geometry is going to be affine in terms of its motion. So I can search for affine models, um, not necessarily matrix multiply unless we do it in homogeneous coordinates. So I can fit things to build up these models. I get an affine model per group. Once I've done this, now I have, a, have, I've have an abstraction, the groups. I have a summary of what the motion of the group is. All I need to do is figure out how to make a picture of it. Um, here we get to play a fun math trick and use affine exponentials, which let us sort of trace the trajectory of something over time to see how that thing would move playing out. Um, that gives us these nice paths. And then there's this sort of the art problem of how do I automatically create the arrow that looks good and sort of doesn't block things and, and, goes, in the right, and, and goes in the right places. Um, if you do all that, you get pictures that look like this. Um, here, the arc 
is conveying the overall shape of the motion. The arrows themselves on those arcs are giving you a sense of what the sort of relative velocities are. So the green piece is, moving, is going to move much faster than the red pieces. Um, and there are also well, there are other parts of the glyph design, but here are some more examples. So you can sort of see when these things start to move, I can get a kind of a sense of what's going to happen here. Is there a significance to the two arrows versus one manga? The, these two, so the, the, these are short arrows, so that means that this thing is not moving very quickly. So you just repeat them? Forward. Yeah, so we try and pack in as many as we can. Um, there's some other sort of subtleties of the, of the actual glyph design, but you can get, sort of get the, the big picture here. We're drawing arrows. Um, so this is sort of comparing um, traditional practice. One nice thing about these arrows is they work you know, the, if you're trying to show these arrows, you're pretty much stuck with these visual representations of the molecule that are, ma that are very sparse, so you can see all the arrows. Where for these, we can do them on top of surfaces, we can do them on top of, of more dense representations. Yeah? So um, there are many ways of conveying motion in a static image. Blur is one of them. Um, stretching is one of them. Um, we did not use that uh, here. It, you, we could combine it with, with the arrows. But um, there are, you, you could use that to convey motion. Um, it has good points and bad points. OK. so. Again, going back to the why a static picture, this is showing me many of the different modes of the same molecule all at once. If I was trying to show the four movies at once, it would be a lot harder. Um, I have not done a user study on that, so this is sort of anecdotal. OK, so that was a sort of a, a quick thing with, with, with how molecules move. Let me move on to a different sort of place. That was sort of pure art. Let me give you one that's much more on the perception side. Um, so where perception really comes in handy is when we have something where there's a huge amount of information that is likely to overwhelm the visual system. So here, understanding that we seem to cope in a world where there's a lot of complexity. Can we make use of our ability to do that in how we design, in, in, in design data presentations? So I'm going to deal with the problem of, se of looking at sequence alignment comparisons. So as you're probably all, all aware, you get these long strings of, well, in this case, it's DNA. They're long, long strings. Um, and they get lots and lots of these. And the first thing they want to do is they don't want to nah, they never, no one ever wants to look at one. They want to look at a whole bunch. Why are these the same? Why are they different? Um, when you just put, you know, you can't look at it at this level, so you build automatic tools that start matching. Um, so you start finding a match, and then you start finding more matches and more matches and more matches. Um, th this is sequence alignment. The, uh, the bioinformatics people do a lot of this. Um, with, and start drawing the connections between them. The thing that we're interested in is not how to do this, but once you've done it, how do you interpret it? And in fact, usually the details of what's inside these things, um, well, these, this is all also very schematic. These tend to be very long pieces. Um, we're a little less interested in that. Mainly what we're sort of thinking about is the level of abstraction of the, here we have four different sequences. These sequences each have some things that, are, that are the same and some things that are different. They're reorderings. Things move around. Um, these alignments are really important. People look at them a lot. And they build tools that show exactly that information. So this is a, um, a, a tool that gets a lot of use that just I'm, I'm going to pick on a little bit because these are the people who are our collaborators. Um, but this is a very successful tool. Um, but it's only one of many different ways of looking at this kind of information. There are many different ways, um, but they're all going to have a similar problem. Um, I'm going to focus on, on MAUV. Uh, that if I have a lot, it just doesn't work. Now, even our collaborators who, who built this thing say it really breaks down after six or seven. Um, so what am I going to do with this? 
Uh, so uh, as a professor, the, uh, the, the right answer is find a smart graduate student. Um, but really, there, there, there's a two tricks that we're, going to, that we're going to have to draw on. The first is a bit of realism. We're not, if I'm going to have this much stuff, I'm not going to be able to build something where you can see all the details. So uh, a degree of realism is important. And the next thing is I'm going to need to think about how our perceptual system deals with very, very complex displays to try and get at displays that we can po that, that have a prayer of working. So the thing we built looks like this. It's called Sequence Surveyor. Um, one of the things to notice is our goal is to get overviews. We're just trying to get the big picture and it'll help point you at, the, at what the interesting details might be and then you can use those more traditional tools that are very good at looking at the specific details. Um, so how do, how do you go about doing this? Um, the first thing is to give you a notion of scale. Scale happens in many different forms. The first, the m most obvious one is the number of genomes, right? If you can compare eight things, well, before you know it, you want to compare 50 things or 100 things uh, or 1,000 things. There's also scale in terms of how long these sequences are. Um, you start out with viruses that have a smaller number of genes. You work up to bacteria that have larger number of genes. Um, I'll show you a case with fungi that have more than that, but someday you want to get all the way to mammals that might have lots and lots and lots, or even more plants, which have enormous genomes. One of the things, though, that's interesting is that as the data gets bigger with these new, sen with these new sets of scale, the questions that the biologists ask change. So they, they keep asking new and different kinds of questions, and if you know, they don't have tools for looking at 100 genomes, they're not even sure what the right questions to ask if you could look at 100 genomes, which kind of makes this interesting. So we need to be able to scale in terms of number of genomes, length, and what you're actually going to be looking for. So sequence surveyor looks different than the things you've seen before. Uh, if you, uh, or or if, and if you've only seen this one, it obviously looks different. This is showing the same sense of set of data. Uh, I'm going to do a bit of comparison between these two in some of these slides just to give you a sense of why this kind of a design works. Okay, so the biggest trick we're going to have in order to try and design a new display is to go to the perception literature and try and figure out, well, why, how do people cope with very, very complex scenes? What can we learn from that? And how can that inform our design? So uh, set my student Danielle out into the literature. And the first thing that people come up with is this idea of pre-attentive pre phenomena. People are really good at finding needles in, the, in, in a haystack if that needle is made to pop out. Here, you can find the red blocks on the bottom really quickly because this pre-attentive phenomena, they pop out using sort of the parallel hardware in your eye. Uh, now, sometimes pre-attentive phenomena don't, don't sort of get you all the way. So you have to search and scan through the image. Well, here, there's a lot known about how people scan through the image. If I'm trying to, follow, if I'm trying to do scanning in the sort of moth style display on the top, trying to follow those lines, that's much more challenging than something that has a reading order where I can move my eyes along set known horizontal patterns and follow things more easily. Some more recent work in uh, in perception has looked at this concept of visual clutter. At some point, there's just too many things for you to actually make comprehension of the individual details. In this case, the clutter kind of serves as a texture. And you can recognize these textures and say, oh, this is what's kind of going on, even though you don't know what's, you don't get the exact details. And finally, there's this interesting phenomena of summarization. When you see something, you can, when you see a lot of something, your, your eye brain, your perceptual system, it's unclear if it's the eye or the, where in the eye brain it sort of happens, is able to very quickly get an assessment of the bigger picture of what's going on. You actually can compute the statistics very efficiently. Um, one way to think about this is 
you get you, you if you blur the if if there's too much stuff, I can blur it and just sort of get a squint at it and get a quick, quick glance of this is what's going on. So we need to come up with designs that, when you squint at them, still give you that a meaningful bit of big picture information rather than just turning into gray mush. Now. All these tricks are great because they give us ways of if you know what you're trying to see, we can make them stand out. We can make them easier to see. So using pre-attention, we can make things pop out. We can, if I know what you're searching for, I can make it easier for you to search for them. I can think about what textures are forming. Um, but the question, though, is if I, don't know what you're if I don't know what you're looking for, I don't know what to make pop out. So the next trick to play in designing this system is to build flexible ways for users to decide what's going to pop out. Um, and this is a, so by thinking about the ways that the data itself, those sequences, are getting mapped onto the, the, the visual representations. Um, in this design, we get the ability to map things based on what color. So how does the data map to the different colors? We can then, once we choose what that mapping is, choose different color schemes, whether we're going to use a uniform color scheme or a split color scheme um, or diverging color schemes um, that are able to make different parts of the data stand out or not stand out. And then finally, when we lay out the, the, the sequences, we don't only have to lay the sequences out from beginning to end. By using different orderings and mapping different data to different things along the positions, we can make different things stand out. So by having these different um, paradigms for mapping, we're able to sort of mix and match. And here's a small set of the, mix, of the things we can mix, mix and match. Uh, one of the things you might say is, well, wait a minute, isn't this going to you know, overwhelm the user who has to sort of choose through this? Uh, I don't have a good answer to that one. But my thought is that over time, what we're going to find with experience is a few of these are going to be useful. And we won't need to give the user the, f the full flexibility if, that's o if that turns out to be overwhelming. Right now, we're still in the early phases where we're trying lots of stuff and we're actually finding, oh, it turns out that this, com this combination that I never would have guessed would be interesting is good for something. Now, now, one of the other things that comes up is you will have more data than you have sort of space on the screen. So there's this issue of how am I going to pack it in? The, to, as a graphics person, the right thing to do is to downsample. But we're not going to do that here for reasons that I'll, might become clear in a moment. For each little block of screen real estate, I'm going to represent, I'm going to sort of stick some number of pieces of data into that and then decide based on what's in there how best to summarize it in that little block. So I'm almost intentionally going to do some aliasing. Uh, in general, there are lots of things will go into each block. So the most obvious way to sort of put a lot of data into one block is to average. And if you're going to do this, then probably you, doing downsampling would have been better. The reason we're not going to downsample is there's more than just averaging. So by choosing the diff different ways of packing that, so the data into the small block, we can make different things come out. So averages, and particularly doing robust averages, are really good at giving you the big trends. Sometimes what you really care about are the outliers. So this view here takes the general trends and over accentuates the outliers. Because in biology, outliers are often the significant events that you're looking for. Um, this one here just kind of mixes it up randomly. Um, it turns out that be, for some perceptual reasons that we're just beginning to study, your ability to see things in these textures is it, it's pretty interesting. I'll show you an example in a moment. All right, so what does this get used for? So you put this in front of the biologists. You, you, you get a whole bunch of, of here bacteria. You align them, and you put it in front of a biologist. And the first thing they say is, ooh, pretty colors. Um, the next thing they say is, where's my favorite bacterium? Um, luckily, uh, the, back, the biologists here picked um, E. coli K12. It's the one with the arrow next to it. Uh, 
and things really quickly start to emerge. So here, uh, the, the selected one is colored orange to yellow. So if you see something here that's orange to yellow, then, you, then, then it's in, that's its position in the reference. So here, we can see this guy here. Um, all the cool colors, it's because of the split ramp, it's things that don't appear in the reference. We can see how that thing is common. We can see, oh, here's a group of things that have a lot of stuff that isn't in the reference. Um, a lot of, so these things start, uh, these kinds of patterns emerge. Um, one of the things you might notice in this set of 100, uh, oh, the other thing which biologists said was, wow, I would have never have thought to look at a, that diverse a set all at once. Um, it turns out those top things up there are parasites that live inside of aphids. Um, they're very, very, they're, so by sort of need, they need to be very, very short genomes. So uh, these, they're called Buchanera. Um, and they have the interesting fact that because they're so small, evolutionary pressure has forced them to only be the very narrow, um, the, sort of the most essential genes. But these turned out to be common across just about all other bacteria. So it's kind of an interesting sort of visual evolution lesson of what's truly, you know, the things sort of get back to the sort of core of what's most important. Um, so here's an example where uh, what we're, tr we're trying to sort of show that the things in Buchanera appear, every, appear in other places. Um, if I do averaging, you can't see that they appear everywhere because they're not really, they're not the most common thing. If I use color weaving, you get a sense of, oh, here's where those things are appearing and here's where they're not appearing. Um, all right, so this one is uh, 37 fungi. Uh, I used to say they were yeast, but then the, uh, don't ask me what the difference between yeast and fungi is. Um, but the first thing, we, we pulled this up and showed the biologists and they said, oh, what's this thing that appears a zillion times? There must, there's a bug in my alignment algorithm. So they didn't, so they went away, came back with a new alignment algorithm. Um, and by the way, they were working on this data set for a long time before they, you know, it's just obvious, it took them 15 seconds. Uh, then they came back with this one and they said, huh, why didn't those match anything? Um, and they, oh, alignment algorithm is still broken. Um, so, uh, Right now, this has proven to be really useful for visual debugging of these uh, large-scale genetics algorithms, but um, I wish I could sort of say the biology discoveries. But the worst thing is, I, even if the, the, they had a biology discovery, I wouldn't be able to explain it to you. So let me show you this stuff on a, a much simpler data set that I can sort of, because we're also like you know, closet linguists. This is taking the Google Books data set where they scanned 14 million books over the past 500 years. Um, I'm only looking at the past 30 decades, so this is since 1670. Um, the way to read this is decades are going up. So this is the decade of the 2000s. Going up is older, so the top is 1670. Going this direction is the most common word. So like the most common word in 2000 is here. So the most common word in 2000 is the. Um, this is colored by its position in, the, in 2000. So in 2000, the is the most common word. And not surprisingly, the most common words in 2000 were the most common words for the past 300 or so years. Um, you can see other patterns like you know, the amount, the most, if you go back far enough, the most common words don't necessarily overlap. Um, you can sort of see the evolution of language start to happen. Um, one of the things that's interesting here, what I'm coloring by is how many different decades does a word appear in the top, I think this is 2,000, but it might be 5,000. Um, so again, the most common words have been common across all time, but as you get further out, newer words are starting to come in. Um, using those different encodings, I can look for specific elements that might be interesting. So here, looking in 2000, you can see you don't have to go too far back before you start to see some words that are, that are common but relatively new. Um, so our linguistics collaborators are kind of happy about this. One of the things that's cool is that the kind of things that we were starting to build for them looked more like this. Now, this is great for looking at, say, 50 words or 75 words. But the other one I was looking at, you know, the top 5,000. This just does not scale. Um, I 
I want to move on to video, but I just want to sort of mention quickly, um, this is part of a bigger e effort to try and build tools for scholars who are trying to understand the evolution of writing and print um, through the sort of the era when it evolved from 1470 to 1800. Um, they tend to look at scatter plots and things like that. Um, we built special tools for them that turn out to look, well, like scatter plots with other little gadgets. One of the things that's really interesting about what they need to do is because they're not, the, there are few people in, the, in, the liter, in, in literary scholarship who like statistics, but if they want to convince their friends, their friends don't like statistics. So at the end of the day, they need to have ways of going back, well, whatever the pattern is of why this, those are over there and over here, can you show me a passage of text that exemplifies that? So we've had to build tools that show that off, um, which has been kind of fun. Um, okay, so quickly because I want to move on to video. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different domains we're working in in terms of visualization. Um, the common thread for me of why, why we're picking these is I'm really interested in comparison because I believe that comparing different things is a common thing independent of what, we're, what you're trying to compare and there are lessons to be learned from it. But I'm, I'm going to skip that to go on to, to, to video because I wanted to get through this. Okay. So video. Well, can I just ask a question yeah. about visualization? So, I mean, one of the things about, maybe maybe not the, I don't know how technologically sophisticated the linguists are, for example, but one of the things about visualization that's sort of um, chicken and egg is that if you knew what you were looking for, presumably you could write an algorithm that would look for it. Right. Ah, so there, there's two different things there. So first of all, there's exploratory and explanatory visualizations. But even with, um, ex with explore, exploration, here they know what they're looking for, right? They, or so that, that scatter plot was actually Shakespeare. Um, there is no doubt in their minds that Hamlet is a tragedy. What they're looking for there is, does the low level data, their observations of word usage, can you tell tragedies based just on the low level features of word usage? So those are the kinds of patterns they're trying to, that they're trying to find. So they, yes, they know the answer, but they're not just interested in the answer. They're looking for the deeper story that they might need visual exploration to find and visual communication to explain to people. I guess, yeah. Okay. The opposite is also true in that anomalies pop out. Those are situations where you didn't yeah. know what you didn't know. So the whole question of why visualize, we could go on, we, we could fill the week with that. Yeah. But all right, so if you don't like visualization, we'll move on to video stabilization. Um, all right, quickly, the problem, if you have a camera, you're holding it, it bounces around while you walk around. Um, and every camera you can buy nowadays has something for filtering it out. Um, we want to do better. So the two pieces of this where art comes in is I want to understand, well, what should you do? What should good video look like? And can we try and make good video, not just get rid of the shakes? And then the perception stuff is even if you want to remove the shake, the shakiness, some uh, impossible vision problems will come up. And uh, I don't want to solve impossible problems. So I want, I want to use perception as a way of letting me cheat. So I'm going to talk very briefly about three different video stabilization projects. One was re-cinematography, which sort of started this out. We did it sort of using how can we use, sort of take our knowledge of film and then use conventional video stabilization technology. And then when we were unsatisfied with conventional stabilization, you know, this is just how do we actually just do the sort of basic moving the images around better, um, culminating with something that is already in an Adobe product. Okay, so when I was here, um, the only class that is on my CMU transcript is Filmmaking 101. Um, and actually, Matt will know that that's because it, back then they didn't give grades. Uh, and Pittsburgh filmmakers did. Um, so, I, so I've had this long-standing interest in film and understanding why you know, what makes for good, good film and what makes for good cinematography. And there are all these rules. And basically, they all boil down to if the camera moves, it should be intentional. So yes, there are actually times when a professional videographer will shake the camera, but that's because they know what they're doing and they're trying to introduce an effect. So 
if I want to try and do something better than just filtering out, if I just sort of take my bad video and get rid of the jitters, it still will wander around and won't have that property of, of looking intentional. So this all came to me where I, I did take a film class. I did well in it. But the class, when, when my son was about to take his first steps, I was lucky I got the lens cap off. I wasn't going to have time to remember, OK, how do I get the tripod? I get a thing on the tripod. I want, how do I go to plan the motion? No, I was just happy to get the lens cap off. So um, I, I can show you the result. This is that, the, the, Running our system on this turns out to be a negative result, but uh, various <laughs> rules. Um, a very instructive one, though. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick a different negative result to show you in a minute. Um, so, it, but it boils down to say, so what you ultimately want to do is every time the camera moves, it should be intentional. So if you want to build a system that realizes that, it has to have two pieces. It first has to figure out or guess at what the camera operator's intention was. And then it has to do something to actually make that happen. So what in recent cinematography, it tried to do this in a relatively simple way, sort of going back to assuming that the, the, the camera operator was only trying to do film 101 kind of tricks. So the main thing there, because the, the, the motion should be intentional, if I was trying to hold the camera still, I should be holding the camera exactly still. It shouldn't just be wobbling around. If I'm going from place to place, it should move smoothly between place to place so that it's easier for you to follow and it's easier to see where things are going. Um, and it does that. Um, this is a graph of, oh, I'm, I'm going to sort of skip these. So it gets the velocities down to zero if it's supposed to be zero. It um, has constant velocity when it sort of, when the camera pans. Um, it eases in and eases out because that makes the transitions easier, um, but it fails a bunch of the time. Um, one of the things is just if the source video, the computer vision so for doing motion estimation fails, there's nothing you can do. Um, this visual artifacts from bad impending, I'll talk, I'll talk, also I'm going to talk a bunch about both of these because each of these are going to motivate the next thing I'm going to do. Um, now, the first I issue is the behind this, to actually the, the make it be so part, to move the images around, we're using conventional technology. Most video stabilization is based on you do some motion understanding to figure out how to sort of move, move things around, and then you apply a full frame warp, usually a, a homography or maybe just even just a translation, um, to try and smooth out that motion. That because this doesn't model parallax, it, you can't move the camera very far. So if I'm trying to do stabilization that's very aggressive and sort of say, well, no, I really want to hold the camera in place even though you're doing this, it, it kind of breaks down. Um, we'll go after this in the, nec in the next project. The other issue, um, well, oh, right. So here's holding the camera still. Um, now, this is an intent problem of do you like it moving back and forth good, better than you like it um, sort of holding steady. So some people find this distracting, um, it, but, but it does convey a sense of the motion. Um, but you might also notice the artifacts. Um, in particular, here's one frame. Uh, this woman is very important. She's my wife. But she is not in the, in the source frame. Notice that since we had to shift the whole thing over a whole bunch, because I was moving the camera a lot, I had to fill in from either the past or the future. So th this is coming from three seconds in the future. And it creates a, a visual artifact that you probably all noticed. Um, those two problems are things that I don't want, that I want to try and address in the next piece of work. So how are we going to get beyond this? I mean, these two problems. Um, now, people had been tinkering with this idea of 3D video stabilization. And the basic idea is you do fancy computer vision, structure from motion or something, construct a 3D model of the world. That tells you where the camera was. Then you think of what a good camera path should be. And then you, can re then you uh, synthesize new views from where that camera was. Um, all right, the structure for motion part, uh, you can download sort of systems or you can buy really good systems. Or I'm sure there are people here who have even better ways of doing it. Um, once you have the camera in 3D, you can even reason about the camera in 3D and do much better. Um, but now the problem is, how am I going to do this novel viewpoint rendering problem? Well, to make things worse, I want to do sort of a video correct novel viewpoint rendering. Um, 
there's no guarantee that I'm going to be able to build a highly detailed model because I may not have enough information. Um, so, well, let's try and do image-based rendering to try and do it. Everyone in the past who's tried to do this uses image-based rendering to try and build up a visual model based on a whole bunch of frames. But that brings back this problem, right? I don't want to have to use the future because if the scene is dynamic, I, I'm going to have things that I'm going to be pulling in the future. I'm going to get ghosting and all those kinds of effects. So I have this problem where I want to move the camera to a different location. I'm not, I want to do novel viewpoint rendering from a single source image. How can I do this? Well, if you think about it as a, from a computer vision point of view, it is impossible because there's, um, you don't have a, ge a full geometric model. So when you have a disocclusion or a lighting change or something like that, you're stuck. So when you have an impossible problem, you need to cheat. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to cheat. Um, we're going to, pay, and this is where perception comes in of like, you know, if I fudge the image a little bit, you might not notice. Um, especially since we're not moving the viewpoint that far. So if I just fudge the image a little bit, it'll work. So here's the idea. From my structure for motion, I can take a bunch of points. I know how they're going to move around. So those points, I know what's going to happen to them. I'm going to take this very, very same image and use that to stretch, like it was a stretchy canvas, um, stretch the image to sort of get, the, to get it to look right. Now, is this the right thing to do? No. Um, so right, so the, the actual how we do the warp, it's sort of a, a little bit of cleverness there. Um, I don't have time to talk about it. Um, does it work? It actually works pretty well. Now, the, the thing that's kind of interesting is, is this a good reconstruction? So, and just to sort of give you an idea of how bad it is, this is, I'm going to take a single frame and spiral the camera around so you can see how the points move around. Um, this is what happens. Is this a, is, so are these reconstructions correct? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, if that was doing that, I'd be, this is Seattle, so I would be concerned that there's an earthquake. Um, but if you actually you stop and you look at one frame, it's not so bad. Especially remember, these are going by at 30 frames a second. In fact, if I crop the image, it's really hard to tell. OK, so that was all great. Um, you want to ship the thing, um, but it has a bunch of limitations. Uh, Right. Structure for motion takes a long time because of the global algorithm. Um, it, it's really slow. But you know, that isn't the worst, of the worst of the problems, is that structure for motion doesn't work in certain cases. If, the camera doesn't, if you don't have the right camera motion, if you have various kinds of zooms, if you have bad lenses, um, if you have the rolling shutters that all modern cameras have, um, if the motion doesn't sort of have the right kinds of parallax, you can't do structure for motion. So what can we do instead? We can ask, well, well, why do we need this structure for motion thing at all? And the short answer is we need some way of making sure as we move those points around to sort of stretch the image around, we maintain the plausibility of at least those points. Well, can we find a better plausibility constraint? Um, it turns out we can. Um, there is this thing, the low rank constraint. Um, it originally was done for affine cameras by Carlo Tomasi when he was here um, and then extended. But basically, the motion of, the of all the collection of points has to lie in a low dimensional subspace. And this is an approximation for, um, per uh, for perspective cameras. So over a short window of frames, the camera movement has to be in a low dimensional subspace. So to give you a picture, this here is our frames. These here are the, our point tracks, so they're x and y positions. So points come and go. If you take any small window of this big matrix, that has to have low rank. Um, it's somewhere eight, around eight or nine. So the thing you could imagine doing is you could do SVD or, some, or PCA or something, find out what the low dimensional subspace is, filter in the low dimensional subspace, and that maintains the, plausib the, maintains the plausibility. Um, now, to do this in practice, you have to figure out how to do that, the, how to deal with the fact that these matrices are incomplete. Um, and you have to do it with a moving window to get some degree of continuity. Uh, there's a bunch of clever algorithms for doing that. Um, but at the end, um, you get this thing that uh, works on really hard cases. Um, oh, I want to show the end of this video. Uh, it works on hard cases, um, and it's really efficient. 
Um, one of the fun things that happens as you start to build these and people find out about it is they send you fun videos. I really like this one. It's a, uh, a little helicopter. Um, it's going to fly over a sandcastle contest. Um, it's just, I mean, it works. So uh, there are a few other catches you have to deal with, but this is now an Adobe, in an Adobe product. OK. So um, all right, I get five minutes. I want to, I'm going to try and get through this really fast. Hold on to your chairs. Um, if you remember, I started out because I wanted to use my cinemagraphic knowledge. Um, now, in re cinematography, I was using it. In 3D stabilization, I had the potential to use it a lot because I could reason about the camera in 3D. But at the end of the day, all I did was filter. And then when I got down to subspace stabilization, all I was doing was filtering. So I wanted to get back to uh, the cinematography aspects of it. So I started to think about, well, could we do stabilization in virtual worlds? Um, now, the big question you probably ask is, why would I want to do this? Um, and I, I should begin by saying I am a VR skeptic, but I work with people who are not. Um, they're also very interested in home health care. And you might wonder, why, what does home health care have to do with virtual reality? Um, well, in home health care, right, you need to be able to design things to work in the home, because lots of stuff, lots of health care things start happening in the home. Um, so, People are good at thinking about how do you design stuff to work in the hospital. Uh, they get really thrown about how do you think in a house. Which means if we're going to really think about the future where we have to make healthcare work in a house, um, the way that we have been doing it with our nice labs, it doesn't work too well. Um, so the people that I'm working with are wondering whether or not they can use visual simulation as a way of, of exploring this kind of, to do the behavioral science. Um, and this is a research question. Can we use visual simulation to try and get at these behavioral effects? You know, jury is out. But one of the things that we need to be able to do is if we have a participant in one of these virtual experiences, we need to look at what happened to them and what they experienced, which got us thinking about how are we going to review virtual experiences. So you put somebody in a head track display, um, or I guess it's dark here, you know, in a cave where you know, their head is, is, so they're in a room where their head is tracked. Um, you get exactly that unsteady camera problem that we solve with video stabilization. Except it's much easier because, well, first of all, we have all the 3D information because we have a perfect reconstruction of the world. We have perfect head tracking. So we can really start to think about what do we do with the cinematography. Um, also, we can take advantage of the fact that we really can synthesize just about any view we want. Therefore, we can consider things like widening the field of view to give more context. So here's what happens. So here's a, a student. Um, Joe is moving around in this virtual museum. He is looking at stuff. We want to know what happens to him. If we watch it from his perspective, uh, it is both difficult to watch for more than a few uh, a, a minute or two, um, and it's actually difficult to figure out sort of what he w what's going on. What we're going to do is apply very very aggressive stabilization, and then reproject where the specifics of where he's looking, so we can sort of get a sense of that. Um, notice that you see the smooth pans and stuff that we talked about from the beginning of the of re cinematography. Oh, it's looping. All right, so how does this work? So the first thing is to take that cinematography model that I talked about from re-cinematography of breaking things into small pieces um, where we're either going to hold steady or move in smooth paths. One of the tricks to this is to use a content-dependent metric. So a small movement of the camera might cause a big change in what you see. A big change in and the camera might call it a small change in what you see. We want to really sort of maintain and group based on what people are looking at. Um, and Kevin, the postdoc who did most of this work, came up with a very clever algorithm using the GPU to do that efficiently. Once you have, once you have this metric, you can segment the long motion into small pieces. Um, this is really neat because you get groups of things that people were looking at. It's a really nice summarization of what's going on. Um, and from that, then we can try and generate these, these good paths. Because we can reason about things in 3D, I can use those exponential coordinate tricks that we used for the, um, for the molecules uh, to make nice smooth paths. And then we sort of put a headlight on the user to sort of see exactly where they were looking and have that move around. Um, so here is more of that.
So you can see it holds steady, then, then moves to other places. This works really well on all sorts of data. If you just filter, it does that wandering thing. But here, right, it's much easier to sort of say, OK, this is what's going on with what they're doing. And unlike with, right, I'll just skip to the, unlike most of the other things, we actually try to say, well, can we really understand what's going on? And there's, there's two pieces to this. One is, did we capture what the participant really saw? So we want to ask them, like, were these the objects you were looking at? Is our segmentation good? And then subjectively, the people who watch these playbacks, both <coughs> did you like looking at it more and can you actually figure out what people were doing? And based on very, very cursory studies, which mainly tell us these studies are hard to design, it looks like the answer is yes on all accounts. Um, OK. I've gotten through a lot of stuff in a little, probably a little bit more time than I should have used. So um, with that, I just want to end again with this thought that in all of these cases, the key thing here is we're trying to use this understanding of how we see and how people have created imagery over the past millennia and use those together to build better tools. So with that, I will thank you, and I'm sorry for running long, but. And I can take questions, sir. Any questions for Mike? Yeah. Is there a place where you have, like you said, people submitted their own videos? Is there a place like the internet where we can view the correct Um So there are. There are examples from, from all of our papers we did. Uh, so the, the question was, um, can you see the results? Um, our, we, we published a bunch of results. Um, many of the videos that people gave us, we don't have permission to do that with. Uh, for the Adobe product, there's tons and tons of stuff out there already where people are, are, are showing the results. But you can go to the web pages associated with the pa papers and see, see examples. I want to get back to this question about like discovering new things. Yeah. Right? So let's say you wanted to do planetary science, but you wanted to automate it. Um, so you, you don't have that data to really explore. The data link back to Earth is really slow. Right. right. So you have to compress it. Is do you think it's viable to use these kinds of techniques to pare down the data and still do science, or is it necessary to really have all the data so you can explore it and transform it over and over again? Okay, so let me sort of say, is does, does better visualization tools help you when you have, if you have issues with obtaining data? It's sort of a, 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 an oversimplification, sure. but um, so on one hand the answer is no, right? If, if, if the information you're looking for isn't in your data, if a tool helped you find it, it would be doing something wrong. On the other hand, I believe very strongly that good tools can help you understand what you have and what you don't have in the context of exploring what actually is there. So one of the things I didn't show was the follow-on to sequence surveyor for virology data where they have a lot of uncertainty and it sort of what they were finding with their traditional tools is not only could they not look at things at scale, but the, the things that would pop out to them were just turned out to be things they didn't have enough certainty about. As soon as we built a tool that was aware of the uncertainty, they're able to say, no, don't show me stuff I'm not certain of and sort of really get into the things that they really cared about. So I, I, it, that doesn't help the fact that you know, at the end of the day there's uncertainties that are limited in what they could learn, but I think it can help them learn more given the constraint they have. That's a good question though. What about, um, so, so none of those examples that you used for visualization were interactive. Those also would be big data, produce some visualization. Um, actually, so it, it, I didn't show them interactively, but they turn out they all are very interactive. So um, one of the pieces, especially with, uh, for example, sequence surveyor, um, the reason that an overview tool works is that you need to have lots of good ways of getting at, well, I think I see this. Let me zoom in a little bit and try and understand what would be causing that pattern. So part of Sequence Surveyor was the design of interaction techniques that worked with those rich and complex displays. Um, similarly, 
Um, the motion stuff, uh, it's, main, it's, it's mainly useful there. You, you rotate things around. Um, the, uh, the, um, well, all of the things are more fun when you can sort of rotate and spin them. But uh, it turns out also that you want to be able to interact with the level of abstraction too. But that's a, a subtle one. Yeah. How do you prototype with, um, those visualization designs, especially those that require a large amount of data? How do we prototype them? Uh, the short answer is not very well. Um, in fact, sequence surveyor started out as a prototyping effort just to see what it would look like. But building something that worked at that scale required a pretty massive engineering effort. And it was basically over a year before we could even put something in front of, a, in front of someone. And even now, our turn, you know, and because we were thinking we were just building a prototype, we didn't build something that was engineered well enough that now it's like, oh, that's great, but I need this. It's not, so um, I, I, I think that the short answer is not very well, and that's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, but I don't have any good answers. Something I expected to work. What did I expect? Oh, um, all right. So, well, all right. So one of the things, all right, so one of the things that, that was totally wrong with the molecules that we tried, it turns out you can't you you have to you can't really use color on those surfaces very much because the Brightness values in the color get involved, mess up your shape perception with the with the luminance, so um, that that was it was much, much less that we were surprised, but we were we sort of had you know we weren't thinking about it when we tried it. Um, it turns out the sequence surveyor design um, wasn't surprising, but but that was because we didn't read the perceptual literature that said these complex color that that the summary statistics the the current theory of how people get summary statistics suggests that it shouldn't work very well for color. So we then actually ran a study recently where we found out that it does, and um, our perceptual science collaborator is kind of uh, he's really scratching his head because he really wants to hold on to the theory that says it shouldn't. Um, what else? I don't know if I have any other good sort of surprise examples. Yeah. So you borrowed from comic books certain sort of design elements that then you brought into your app to create the variables. Huh? But how do you get people to actually understand the properties of the arrow? Oh, that's a great question. So, so a bigger question is, do those arrow diagrams work? The, the, the honest and total answer is I have no idea. Um, all I have is anecdotal evidence where um, we went, we generated a whole bunch of them, we showed them to a biochemist and says, who, who knew the molecule and said, is this showing what's going on? And he said, yeah, that's really great. I wish I, could, I, wish I had that when I, you know. So all, all I have those anecdotes. And I think also there's a huge, a huge rich space of how you do those arrows that you know, this was a really rough guess. And I guess that's another place where we tried a bunch of things. I can tell you a bunch of things that don't work. I'm not sure that those really do. But um, anecdotally, people seem to like them because they get the big picture across. Um, they also have the feature that if they're kind of, there are cases where they don't work. And the algorithm can actually ad somewhat identify where it doesn't work. So they're mainly good if it's a, ro if it's a rotation. Um, and we know if it's, a, if it's not a rotation, we sort of say, oh, you know, it's not a rotation. This isn't going to work very well. So we don't show it. Yeah? Are you familiar with iMovie's implementation of um, video stabilization? Is it similar to what? So I, sorry, so as of, last summer, or this past summer, when we sort of last ran ex examples, iMovie was doing the 2D stabilization. So they had a nice implementation of the 2D um, thing. Um, on a given day, each, each, you know, each iteration, there, there was a, actually a, there, we were, for a while there was this free tool that was as good as any. 
Um, there was a while when our when our implementation of 2D stabilization looked better on most of our examples in iMovies. Um, one thing that I'm that for our 2D stabilization stuff, I was infilling. Um, iMovie doesn't infill; it only crops. So uh, it's a little bit of a unfair comparison. But they're also theirs is also much more robust and efficient. So, yeah. Uh, so most of the things you're visualizing are new things, like molecules and stuff that uh, artists don't really have a tradition of, of visualizing. So do you think that your your core thesis that artist traditions should be leveraged can hold you back as much as they can push you forward? So. Um, can artist traditions hold you back? Um, potentially. However, so first of all, I'm not bound to them. Um, they're a rich source. And if I could come up with something that defied artistic tradition, maybe I would try it. But usually you're stumped. Um, for example, I don't think there's really an artistic tradition behind the, 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 the genetics displays. Um, although, one of the, even there, actually, what we found was we, there's a new version of the, the, the student who did that actually took an art class and learned about sort of how artists view color theory and came up with a bunch of new color palettes that are based on um, sort of this theory of color, the art of, an, of what colors go together nicely. So I, I actually think it, looked, it, it improves the tool. But um, I think it is possible if you limit yourself to only say, I can only do stuff where I can draw from it. But it's more like, I can draw from it, I can also choose not to. So given all of your experiences, do you have any sense of when you choose not to? Because that's your thesis, right? Your thesis says that we should use it. I should, yeah. Did I say should or did I say could? <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, maybe I should change it to, sh to could. Um, well, I say you should draw on it for inspiration. Um, there's a common thing in, that they talk about for art students of you need to know the rules before you break them. That if you're going to do something that defies the tradition, there's probably a reason why people aren't doing it, and you might want to understand that first before you break the rule. I think cinematography is a, is a good case of that. Um, nowadays, you watch things, you see film, you, you, know, you see the MTV three second cut, cut on threes pacing. Um, you could do that, but you should only do that, you know, that sort of defied the previous artistic tradition. And, may, and it's sort of a, asking a lot from, the, from viewers. Nowadays, right, it's been around for 10, 20 years. Everyone's used to it. But when that first came out, um, so yeah, I, I, but the, the point is well taken that uh, sometimes you know, once you know the rules, the thing you realize is I do want to break them. Yeah. What's the nature of your? Uh No, I don't really have good collaborators the, uh, on the art side. Um, I uh, and so, and some of that is just who's around, um, and I haven't made as much of an effort. Um, one of the things that I did do um, that didn't, it really didn't come up too much. I spent a bunch of time with, with some photojournalists trying to learn about how they view pictures. Um, but really, uh, you know, one of the great things about art is you, it, there are great resources for learning about it. One of the downsides about talking to practitioners is the way that they think about it isn't always the way that's going to help me think about it. So, you can read a lot of cinematography books and not come up with the sort of, you can summarize this as um, all movements should be motivated. Um, so it's a, a language barrier. It's a language barrier. Yeah, it's a very different way of thinking about it. Um, and also, this is a, one of those very gross overstatements that I might regret. Oh, I'm on video. So now I'm, I'm, I'm really going to regret saying this, and you're going to have it on video. Artists don't necessarily distill principles in ways that generalize the way that we like to think about sort of abstractions as a computer scientist. So often, the way that artists think about it 
is not necessarily the right way to think about it. So it's more like, let me look at what the artist does rather than how and why they do it. Um, a similar thing there is it's often better to look at how novices are taught because that's sort of the more pure principle rather than the subtleties. Um, you know, these, that sort of, you need to know the rules before you break them kind of thing. But that's a, you know, that's a whole, how do I, how, how do you better, how do you better engage the artist in the process, which I wish I had a better answer for. I think it's a much, you know, this, this, this is the place for that to happen because I think this is a place with a tradition of the art and the science sitting next to each other and now even with a bridge connecting them, so. Thank you, Mr.